Hello all. In this video, I am going to talk about open banking in India. That is the recent implementation of account aggregators. This video is only an introduction about why we require open banking and how is account aggregators implemented in India. This video is split into three sections. The first section, we are going to talk about the various products offered by financial institutions and the later needs for them. In the second section, I'm going to give an introduction about account aggregators and the various parties involved and their responsibilities. In the third section, we're going to talk about the data flow in case of account aggregators. Now let's move into the first section. Banks typically offer different type of products to the end customers. Uh, I'm not covering all the products, but primarily there are savings accounts, checking accounts, fixed deposits, etc. That's kind of assets for personal assets. And the second type of products is personal finance management. It's not just banks or financial institutions. It could be third party companies who offer wealth management, budgeting apps, etc. And the other class of products are lending products like credit cards, loans, buy now pay letters, etc. In case of asset products like personal assets, these institutions only ask typically for a KYC related documentation like photos, age and residence proofs, etc. etc. Whereas in case of personal finance management applications, the institutions demand not just for the KYC data, they also want to know about the various uh, income sources of yours and the various assets and liability information. How do they obtain them? Usually from bank statements, salary slips, tax statements, etc. In case of lending products, apart from KYC and the income information, they also might request for the collateral information for which the loan is being offered for. Is it for a car loan or is it for a home loan, etc. So how do these institutions get this data, right? So first, in case of a KYC, the individual is supposed to take a printout of the KYC and then uh, you know sign it and then provide it to the institution. And there has been a lot of automation that has been done uh, and these processes are, are digitized where in India we have automated KYC checks using CKYC or Aadhaar XML and uh, we have DigiLocker where the individuals can upload the proofs and an eKYC can be done. Whereas in case of income document submissions, the individual is supposed to provide uh, the physical printout copies of the income proofs or download the income proofs and then upload it into the portals of the banking or the mobile applications or in case of PFM related applications, the individual sometimes need to provide access to the net banking session so that the PFM application can extract the data from the net banking itself. This is where there is a substantial amount of manual work involved for the individual and also the information need not always be complete. It all depends on what the individual submits to the institution. Lastly, the collateral information in case of loans, the individual either manually submits the documents or uploads the documents into the portal or the mobile application. What are the challenges with this process when a user submits a document to the financial institution? First thing, there's a lot of manual process involved where the individual is supposed to download or take a printout and then submit. And secondly, the information is restricted to what the individual submits to the financial institution. If the individual has three savings accounts, the individual might just choose to submit only one account's information to the institution for getting a product. The second information is primarily with the bank. So when you have a product with the bank, like when you do all the transactions and the statements, etc., that data resides purely with the bank. The customer has the option to download the data from the portal, but the customer does not have an access more than that, where the customer cannot share the data to some third parties. For example, if that transaction data is given to some budgeting app, the budgeting app might provide you how to manage your budget better. The third challenge is, assuming that the FIs tie up with other financial institutions or third party companies, each of this bank would need to tie up with every single other bank. And if you see, this is how it might look, right? There might be a lot of connections that might be going on between these banks. And there is no technical standard defined where uh, each, uh, how the banks can share data between them. And I'm sure you have referred to or come across this terminology called as open banking, where financial institutions expose their data 
to other third party companies using APIs. Uh, this open banking I've been hearing from about 2015 where European Union announced this PSD2 and uh, many countries started to adopt it. But there is no one standard across the world that every country adopts. Every country have their own methodology and implementation of open banking as such. So in case of open banking, the bank exposes the data present to other third party services or other fintechs or e-commerce companies via APIs. So let's see what are the problems to be solved when it comes to our Indian ecosystem itself, right? First is to ensure digital sharing of data, especially the income data of an individual. Second is to have a common digital framework that not just connects financial institutions, but also connects taxes, pension funds, uh, depositories, etc. And finally, last but not the least, is that the consumer should have the control over what data is being shared and to whom it is, it is being shared and what data is being shared. And that's when we have account aggregators, India's own implementation of open banking, where the data is shared between the financial institutions with the consent of the individual. The key word here is the consent. Only upon the consent of the individual of what data being is being shared and who to whom it is being shared to, the data is shared to the end financial institution. So let's look at the important parties in case of this open banking model in India. The first party is the financial information provider, that is the institution who provides the financial data. Second is the financial information user. This is the end consumer of the data who is requesting the data. The FIU can offer a product like a lending product. The FIU can offer a service like wealth management, etc. And the new entity here is the account aggregators who broke between the FIP and the FIU to ensure the data is shared from the FIP to the FIU. Now let's look at these parties in detail. The first party is FIP. FIP is financial information provider. As the name speaks, these are the entities that provide information to the end financial information user. So what is a financial information? Financial information means bank deposits like saving accounts, FDs, or SIPs or mutual funds or insurance policies, etc. So all of these information which provide a clear financial health of the individual is a financial information. So these FIPs are banks or NBFCs or insurance companies or pension funds or depositories. If you observe here, this is not just a typical bank. These could be pension funds or this could be depositories. So what India have done is they have tried to pull in other sources of financial health indicator providers, not just typical banks. The next entity is financial information users. So financial information users are third party companies or banks who need this information for providing a product or a service to the end consumer. These can be banks or this can be any third party companies who are regulated by the four major regulators in India. Who are the four major regulators? First one is RBI, who takes care of banks and payment systems. The second one is IRDAI, who are the insurance providers. And the third one are PFRDA, who takes care of all the pension providers. And the last one is SEBI, who look over the capital markets. So any entity who are regulated by these four major regulators can become a financial information user. Next, the new major entity are the account aggregators. So these account aggregators are intermediaries between FIUs and FIPs to facilitate the data sharing. So they sit in the middle of the FIP and the FIU and then ensure the smooth passage of the data between them only after getting the consent of the individual. So what happens there? Like if an FIU requests for an information, they will work with an account aggregator. So an account aggregator is responsible to prepare something called as a consent artifact. This is nothing but a consent to get from an individual. We will look at what is consent artifact in the next slide. So the AA is responsible for preparing the consent request, get the consent from the individual and only up upon receiving a consent, ensure the data is requested from the FIP and then provided to the FIU. The AA is also responsible to maintain the consent here. The key thing here is an account aggregator cannot store the data. They can just 
aggregate the data like they can get data from multiple parties and then they can just prepare one final request and send it to the FIU but they cannot store data themselves. So how does a consent look? So when the account aggregator receives a request from a financial information user, they prepare something called as a consent artifact. So what does it contain? It contains the entities that is who requested the data, who is providing the data none other than the FIU or the FIP. What is the purpose of the data? Like why the data is being requested? Is it for a home loan or is it for a service, etc. What data, that is what financial information is being shared? What permission does the FIU have on that particular data? When does this consent expire? And at what frequency can the FIU request the data from the FIP? So all of this encompassed becomes a consent artifact. So the end individual can actually look at all this consent request and then allow the account aggregator to fetch the information. This is the most important aspect of an account aggregator, getting the consent and maintaining the consent and ensure only the data is passed after the consent. Now let's look at a typical data flow. So we have FIP, FIU and account aggregator and then the individual there. So let's say the customer applies for a product or a service with the FIU. The FIU then provides an option to the individual to extract the data of the individual via an account aggregator. The FIU might currently have an option to upload the documents onto their mobile application or portal. But now after account aggregators, the FIUs may provide an additional option to get the data of the individual via an account aggregator. So they will provide an additional option. So once the individual selects this particular option, the FIU forwards that request to the account aggregators to get the data of the individual. Then account aggregator prepares the consent request and then the individual is supposed to log into the account aggregators application and then the individual has to review the consent and then provide an approval for the consent. And the account aggregator then forwards this request of data to the FIP and then FIP provides the data to the account aggregator after the due diligence and then the account aggregator shares with the FIU who had requested the data. So this is the typical data flow. So if you see here, the, there is a separate agreement that is made between the individual and the account aggregator who maintains the consent request that the individual may have provided or revoked with various banks. Some interesting information, uh, there is an entity called REBIT, Reserve Bank Information Technology Limited. Uh, they have created a API specification which all the different partners in the AI ecosystem will really use. There is a separate foundation called as Sahamati who contains all this account aggregator ecosystem members who take care of a smoother and a faster implementation of this entire account aggregator process. The FIUs need not be FIPs but for now it has been agreed that FIUs have to be FIPs. So this diagram in the center you can see the account aggregators and in the outer circle you can see the banks who have been uh, onboarded on to this particular process. Thanks for watching the video. Hope you learned something new from it. Do like and subscribe. I'd love to hear your feedback as well in the form of comments. Thank you.